Wow. I prepared to come to speak to all of you about the importance of thinking in systems. And over the past two days, I've been overwhelmed by how incredibly all of you have been thinking about the impossible problems that we seem to be tackling, but you're thinking about them in systems. So I've shifted my approach a little bit, and instead of thinking about the systems really broadly, I'm going to touch on a couple of aspects of these systems that we may not be paying enough attention to. So I'd like to start by thinking about ecosystems. So we live now in an information ecosystem. It is a complex and adaptive set of systems through which thoughts, information, knowledge, opinions are transferred. And as information transfers through these pathways and these networks, it can often change, which has been shown to be problematic for the field of public health. And this is made only more complex in the digital age, where so much of our information is transferred through communications to people all over the world. We have had unprecedented opportunities to exchange information with people from all over the world. And with this, it means we have a ton of information that's now digitized. And we have the, the ability to analyze that information and understand and contextualize it for the field of public health. And some are beginning to call this field uh, digital epidemiology. So what's digital epidemiology? Researchers have had the opportunity to look at Google search trend data and search terms to try to understand influenza epidemics around the world. People have been able to develop surveillance systems based on texting to better understand dengue or malaria epidemics. And people can analyze sentiment in tweets to, to understand um, better kind of quality health information. And so we have this unprecedented data set. We have print media, we have news media, we have radio broadcasting, we have film, we have entertainment media, and now with all of the social media, we have participatory platforms. And the interesting thing is that the intersection between all of these digital methods and the field of health is networks. We're starting to try to dive a bit more deeply into how this information transfers to people. And it seems that our information networks behave similarly to social networks, where in social networks, we'll have a piece of information, and here the nodes that we're paying attention to are people. And the lines between those people, the lines between those nodes, are relationships through which information and thoughts can pass. And so we visualize this segment of humanity where a message gets from point A to point B to point C. And in my research, we're increasingly finding that media ecosystems and media networks behave in a similar way to social networks. So here, what we're looking at is a network graph of media ecosystems. Rather than the nodes in this graph representing people, the nodes are representing digital media sources. So this includes news media sources online, it includes blogs, it includes um, websites and information that foundations and organizations publish. And the lines between them, the relationships, are essentially the equivalent of academic citations, where news media sources will reference other news media sources or stories, and that symbolizes a passive, passage of information. And we call these inlinks. So, have you ever kind of spent hours looking, I mean, I know that I have, looking for a topic on Wikipedia? Let's say I'm really interested in frogs. So I'm looking up frogs this morning, and I start to scroll through kind of the first paragraph, and it comes upon the concept of habitats. So I'm so excited about habitats, I click on habitats, I start to read about habitats, I get enthralled by habitats. And under habitats, I learn about water ecosystems. So I click on that term, water ecosystems, and essentially that inlinking that carries you from piece of information to piece of information to piece of information is what's represented on this graph. Those are the relationships. And that's one measure of influence in the media that we've started to analyze as who is central to the conversation, who is being referenced most frequently. And we started to do this for language as well. 
where the nodes, rather than being the media sources, are common words used by a variety of sources to talk about an issue. And this lets us know what are the dominant frames in the media around the topics that we care about. And this is particularly important for the field of global health, where perceptions of social norms largely guide behavior. But why are we looking at the media at all in the first place? I have found um, through my research at uh, the MIT Center for Civic Media, at MIT's Media Lab, and the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. I work on a project called Media Cloud, which tries to map out these media ecosystems. So the media is important because it sets the agenda. It lets us know not what to think, but what to think about, what are most important. What, and, and more importantly than that, arguably, what is everybody else thinking about? Because perceptions of social norms, perceptions of what everybody else is thinking about, is a powerful precursor to behavior. So I know that that's a ton of information, and I'll get to some examples which will be really exciting. So let's start with adolescent pregnancy. I'm happy that Karina shared a lot of context and background about that, so um, we can go straight into, the, straight into the media networks, which always jazz me up. Uh, for the record, this is the first time I'm ever talking about my research, and I'm really nervous. I, <laughs> I had a conversation with Salva on the bus this morning, a new friend, and she let me know that telling the audience that I'm nervous will make me a little bit less nervous. <laughs> so I'm hoping that that happens. You can give me 30 seconds, I'll be there with you all. <laughs> So we'll take this first network. So we really wanted to understand in my lab, for the case of adolescent pregnancy, who's influential to the conversation? And what is the impact that that has on behavior outcomes or health outcomes, which in this case would be um, a reduction in teen birth rates? So we looked at the media ecosystem for the US. And we found, as would be expected, the CDC, for example, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, a central node in our network, they're being cited frequently. We found Planned Parenthood, also cited frequently. But one really interesting node that we didn't expect to find was MTV. And we were like, what? Where, where is this coming from? And turns out um, that MTV had released a television show called 16 and Pregnant. So raise your hand if you've ever seen a television show, 16 and Pregnant. Uh, perhaps not as many as would be in another audience, and that's likely because it's highly stigmatizing. The content in 16 and Pregnant is um, stigmatizing content that as public health professionals, we probably breeze past because of that. It's stigmatizing for young girls who are sexually active and largely from lower socioeconomic status. Uh, nonetheless, we're not the audience for that show. Younger teens are the audience for that show. And we found, um, in our, through our analysis, that it was a central node, meaning it was being referenced frequently by the rest of the media ecosystem, which includes news and blogs and organizations. And we found that the language around the conversation of adolescent pregnancy changed after the airing of this show. And this is important because in this example, we're looking at how young people are getting this information. Young people are the target of our interventions related to adolescent pregnancy. So where are they getting their information from? What are their sources of information? It may not be the New York Times. It may not be the Washington Post. Um, it may not be direct information from the CDC or the World Health Organization, but they're getting their information from elsewhere. And it's important that we look at that when we're trying to understand the relationship between information exposure and behavior change. So other studies also found this relationship between information exposure related to 16 and pregnant and behavior outcomes. Here this is, um, we're looking at the amount of tweets that were released, um, or the number of tweets related to both abortion and birth control after the airing of particular episodes and search behavior. And we found that they did relate to um, the release of the episodes of the television show and authors actually also related this to a decrease in teen pregnancy rates in the United States. And so that's, that's one example. And we, now we can take it to the example of vaccines, which is a controversial topic in the US. We kind of have two disparate communities of thought around vaccinations in the US. We have the vaccine confident, confident group 
that are really confident in the research and evidence and science that have been brought forth by public health institutions. And we have the vaccine hesitant group, largely propagated by misinformation related to um, studies um, that have been retracted and deemed fraudulent connecting vaccines with adverse health outcomes. All have been retracted and proven wrong. But nonetheless, even though there are this spread of in misinformation in the US, it seems that vaccination rates in the US are stable, which is great. It's a public health win. But I argue that we may not be looking at the right population. Right now, when we think about the misinformation ecosystem related to vaccines in the United States, we're thinking about news organizations, we're thinking about blogs, largely the ones that parents and adults of childbearing age read and are exposed to. And we're not yet paying attention to the media ecosystem that younger generations are getting socialized into. The social norm right now that is present to them is that there is a vaccine-hesitant community. It exists. It is within their information ecosystem. And unless we understand that, there's no way that we can create the relationship between information exposure and behavior outcomes on a longer term. So what are the platforms that these younger people are getting their information from? We're, we need to be thinking about Snapchat, we need to be thinking about Instagram, and we need to be thinking about places like Pinterest, where 75% of vaccine-related posts are actually anti-vaccination. And if we're not paying attention to the right ecosystem, if we're not zooming out enough to ensure that our solutions and our problems are being looked at in the context of a greater whole, we're really missing the bigger picture. So right now we have this vast opportunity, this vast amount of data that we're able to present, pay attention to, analyze, and try to better understand the influence that the media has on human behavior. But it's, infor it's important to first contextualize, which is why the relationships that we're building at a place like Switchpoint is so important. We have these community-based organizations that are deeply rooted in understanding how communities and individuals get informed in different contexts. It makes sense that, we're thinking of, that if we're thinking about vaccination um, imp improvements in Chile, we look at Twitter to understand sentiment. Or if we're thinking about contraceptive access in Nigeria, we look at Facebook. Or if we're thinking about gender-based violence interventions in South Africa, we think about radio transcriptions. But it's important to contextualize the type of information with the population that we're interested in looking at and not to forget about younger populations. And the great news here is that there are a number of open source tools that are available now so that you're able to analyze these media ecosystems on your own, one of which is the Media Cloud Project that I work on. And um, if you'd like more information about that, I'm happy to share it with you. But the point that I wanted to emphasize is that it's possible through this field of digital ep epidemiology to start asking really, really big questions, but to just maintain in our minds that when we are thinking about analyzing to determine solutions for really complex problems, it's important that we keep considering the whole. Thank you.